I'm Katie Stone, and I am the volunteer helping organize the speaker series. And tonight, for the Friends of Candelaria Farm speaker series, we have a really knowledgeable person with us. Not that we don't always, but this guy's great. Joe Zabrowski. He's an instructor in geospatial technology and geographic information analyst, analyst in New Mexico Highlands University in Las Vegas, New Mexico. He teaches remote sensing and geographic information systems courses and assists students, faculty, and staff with mapping projects. He also works collaboratively with conservation groups, assisting with capacity development, meeting facilitation, and in our case, mapping. Joe's research and application interests center on the use of geospatial technologies in support of collaborative conservation and watershed management. Landscape scaled conservation and restoration is of particular interest. Joe received a Bachelor's of Arts in History and a Master's of Science in Geography, both from Texas A&M University. Thank you so much for being with us tonight for the Friends of Candelaria Farm Speaker Series, Joe. And I'm going to go ahead and give you the big spotlight here so that everybody sees you. And I'm going to give you sharing permissions again because I seem to have totally messed that up. OK, there you go. All right. Well, well, thank you for that introduction, Katie. Um, um, you've caught me at a kind of transitional point in my career, whereas uh, I'm fading away from the teaching at Highlands, but still keeping involved in as much as I can. And uh, I want to give a special shout out to uh, Bob and Sarah Bednars, who uh, were faculty back in the day when I was at Texas A&M getting my master's in, in geography. So it's very exciting to see them here and as my as neighbors here in Albuquerque. So um, so again, thanks. It's really great to see a few other faces as well. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. So I'll give that a, a second. And it's always the technology technology kind of uh, moment of truth here. And I'm going to switch it into a presentation mode. It'll be a PowerPoint presentation. All right, so ask the question, does, is this showing up as a PowerPoint presentation for everybody else? Yes, it is, thank right. you. So uh, I've entitled this presentation, Mapping the Condelaria Nature Preserve with Uncrewed Aerial Systems or Drones. Uh, uncrewed aerial systems is kind of a term that's starting to take over from the term uh, unmanned aerial system to be more inclusive, but it's the basic same concept of using these remotely piloted vehicles to uh, collect information. And before kind of getting into the topic, I want to uh, take a special shout out to the people who've actually been doing the work. So uh, I've actually been more the little bit of the instigator behind the scenes on a lot of this, uh, but the uh, team who've actually been flying the missions to date at the Condelaria Nature Preserve uh, from our organization are uh, Dr. Mike Petronas, uh, Fauscher, uh at the New Mexico Highlands University Geospatial Applications and Natural Sciences Lab. And we actually started out with the New Mexico Forest and Watershed Restoration Institute uh, team with uh, Ms. Patty Dappen, Katie Withnall, Dana uh, Husingfeld, and Elizabeth Becker. Um, so we've grown the team at Highlands, and, and the Institute is also a part of New Mexico. Islands University um, fairly quickly over the past few years. And uh, we are all uh, FAA uh, Part 107 remote pilot certified uh, uh, drone pilots. So that's uh, uh, a kind of neat uh, accomplishment for our little uh, university based out of uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico. What I thought we'd talk about today is kind of a little bit about aerial photography and remote sensing. Um, and then kind of give you basically a guided tour through how we uh, how we've been running our uh, our uh, missions out at Condelaria Nature Preserve and some applications of this kind of in of information and maybe some things we can do in the future as we've uh, grown our work out there. 
as a way of background too, I'll, I'll say, you know, a really big shout out to uh, the Albuquerque Open Space, uh, the Parks Department, Rio Grande Return, and the Ciudad Soil Water Conservation District, as well as the Friends Group. Uh, I basically approached them with the idea that, hey, we could really use a good place to practice uh, flying some of our uh, drones that's uh, accessible, uh, and um, has some, you know, interesting applications as well. So it's a nice open space, not a lot of people running around there. It's kind of closed access to the general public. Uh, and they were very gracious in letting us uh, use that facility as a place for us to learn our skills and test our technology. And we're hoping we can kind of continue to support their mission with the work we're doing. So the next couple of slides are especially for Jeannie. Um, um, she would want me to make the whole presentation about remote sensing, but uh, I'm gonna give you the, the abbreviated version of what could be a whole course or at least a, a lesson in itself. And the reason we're talking about remote sensing is in the case of our work with, uh, uh, with uh, UAS or drones, we're using it to gather using them to gather information about the uh, surface of the earth. And the technology is broadly labeled as remote sensing. Most of us know it as aerial photography uh, for day-to-day -day purposes. But the definition collecting or recording and inter interpreting information about a target or object without being in physical contact with that object um, is really short and to the point and very packed. And I wanna give a shout out to Evelyn Pruitt, the former geographer of the Navy who coined this term. I think we see a lot of definitions uh, and we don't think about the people who actually came up with these. You know, you can imagine that that she was a, was a brilliant woman to have worked in this field back in the late 50s, early 60s and coined this term in a male dominated world, you know, in a in a organization, the, G the Department of the Navy, no less, uh, to have such great influence. So I think it's worth recognizing her contributions to the to the study of the Earth through remote sensing. So the technology, um, you know, we're familiar with, you know, a little bit with with aircraft and satellites uh, taking pictures of the of the of the Earth, and the two kind of approaches that these technologies used to collect that information are called passive and active remote sensing. In passive remote sensing, uh, we are gathering information about objects uh, based on energy that's reflected off of those objects uh, from another, uh, another energy source, such as the sun, or energy that is admitted, emitted from the surface of the earth uh, to the uh, uh, to the sensor uh, radiated. So if we think of uh, the uh, satellite images we see from platforms like Landsat or even aerial photographies, that's passive remote sensing. They're using the uh, energy that's reflected, uh, the sun's energy that's reflected off of objects. When we hear reports about studies of, for example, uh, uh, global warming and sea surface temperature change, things like that, Similar uh, sensors are gathering energy that is emitted from the uh, uh, from the Earth, and we could again have a whole course about how that process all works. Um, many of us also may be familiar with other types of imagery or remote sensing data. For example, radar or lidar that you've heard of. Um, that's considered again an, gathered by an active sensor. That would be a sensor that not only receives energy but it transmits a signal that is uh, basically bounces off that object and is received by that platform. So uh, weather radar uh, would be one example, the LIDAR that we use for mapping, but also even the concept of LIDAR that's now being used on cars or even some of our phones and tablets have LIDAR sensors for measuring distances or, or imaging objects. So that's a form of active remote sensing. And then kind of to bring this idea of remote sensing down to earth uh, uh, a little bit, when we go to, you know, say a dentist or a doctor's office and have an x-ray, you know, that's one form of remote sensing if you look at that definition there. 
MRI scans, any any type of you know gathering of information about an object without directly being in contact with it could be considered a type of remote sensing. And remote sensing uh, takes advantage of the idea that the there's energy being uh, emitted by the sun across a very far range of energy levels or wavelengths from the very dangerous to people gamma rays, very short, high energy to very long uh, wavelengths of, uh, of radio. And so this is energy, some of it we can see, most of it we cannot see with our eyes. We are, our eyes are kind of like remote sensing, remote sensors in that visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about today. And we're going to talk about a little uh, bit beyond that as well. But I know this is a very brief uh, technical overview of the some of the physics or science behind the aerial photography. But I think it's important to understand where this can take us and what we can do with our uh, imaging technology that we apply to these drones. So uh, to final you know, to wrap up on the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, like I said, we're working in this kind of visible and a little bit into the invisible, what's called the near infrared portion of this of the electromagnetic spectrum. And through our uh, imaging technology, we can sense energy in these invisible parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, but visualize them through our computer uh, by assigning colors we can naturally see to the invisible colors. And that will make a little bit more sense in some of the examples I'm going to give. But um, back to what we're doing at Condelaria and with our program uh, overall, uh, our equipment is designed to collect imagery in that uh, visible and near-infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And also, I knew I had to get do a little bit of a technical dive on this because I know some of my audience members personally, and that is kind of what they really get it, get into. So uh, thanks for indulging me on the, uh, on the little science presentation here. All right, so again, we're talking about imagery and we're within kind of a family of, if you will, scales of imagery. Uh, there's a, a long history of satellite imagery going back, you know, commercially to the uh, uh, early 1970s with Landsat uh, to now what's really emerged and, and become a powerhouse in information data collection are drone images. And one way to think about these is in how much data is collected by the sensor and how detailed that information is. So a satellite sensor such as Landsat will cover you know, uh, a geographic footprint of, you know, almost a couple hundred miles by a couple hundred miles, almost. But you don't get a lot of detail in there. The size of a pixel or the footprint of one little computer cell on the ground is about 30 meters. So as you zoom in, it becomes fuzzier and fuzzier. So my graphic here shows as we're zooming in to Condelaria Nature Preserve and almost it becomes indistinguishable uh, at a certain point. Uh, aerial photography has been around for a long, very long time, starting even with balloons back in the mid 1800s, but really being perfected uh, shortly before World War II and uh, continues to be refined to this day. In this case, you know, we can basically uh, customize our level of detail based on the qualities of the camera and the height above the ground that we're flying the aircraft to get, to, again, very detailed photos. And one common product that is freely available to everyone, um, you know, in the world, basically, for the United States are uh, these uh, uh, National Agricultural Imagery Program photos, which are 0.6 meter spatial resolution. And so we can get a pretty good amount of detail off of that. And finally, the drones that we're using at Condelaria, we can get down um, to you know, better than two centimeters uh, uh, ground resolution on that, so we can actually start making out, you know, the individual weeds growing in the cracks on the sidewalk or the ditch, for example. And again, through that spectral technology I was talking about in remote sensing, we can see a little bit beyond what we can see with our naked eye. So what I've done with these images is taken a look at Landsat and that aerial photography and our drone photography, and shifted 
the color spectrum so that I assign those invisible color, the invisible wavelengths of near infrared to the red on my monitor. And so now we can see uh, some things pop. And what that is, is, is uh, healthy vegetation because healthy vegetation reflects very strongly in the near infrared. It reflects much strongly in those wavelengths than it does in the visible green, in fact. So we can really get a lot more information about vegetation when we shift our view of the uh, sun's energy into those invisible wavelengths uh, that comprise the near infrared. All right, so the toys uh, that we have, toys would not be the right word. Dr. Patronus, who's on this call, would probably object because uh, they range in the cost from, you know, $5,000 for our lower end to over $40,000 for our higher end. And what we really can almost call these are flying cameras. It's really about the camera technology and much of the cost in uh, the equipment we're using is in the camera technology that's uh, applied to these. So, you know, it was a little bit nerve wracking for me to think about putting a camera that's $7,000 into this flying object that I may or may not uh, have as much control as I think over. But uh, you'll see here in a few minutes why I feel I can do this with some confidence now. So the Highlands uh, Geospatial Applications and Natural Sciences Lab or GAINS Lab, we have four uh, drones that we're able to use right now for mapping, starting with that fixed wing drone that contains both a regular kind of color camera and one that has one of these spectral sensors. Um, then we have four, three of the uh, quadcopter drones, two of which have regular, you know, natural color cameras, and one of them also has one of these spectral cameras. And I'll leave the details for the real camera buffs here to see some of the details. But if you know cameras, you'll know that those are pretty high-end uh, cameras. And uh, Hasselblad, for example, is a well-known Swedish camera manufacturer that was actually bought out by the drone company uh, to show how important the, the photography is to that line of business to them. The uh, Forest and Watershed Restoration Institute also has two drones and they were actually first out of the block with the drones at Highlands for this kind of mapping purposes. They have this kind of a bird shaped uh, or kind of bat shaped uh, sense fly, or now it's called Ag Eagle with the brand EBX, which has a, uh, a regular true color camera specially designed for mapping and another one of these spectral uh, sensors. And then they have one of the quadcopters that just has a regular plain uh, color camera. Uh, in it. So not a bad fleet for a small uh, uh, institution in uh, northern New Mexico. So what I thought I'd do now is um, take you through some flight planning. And uh, Katie, I think we'll, we'll have plenty of time for some questions at the end. So it might be best if we just do questions then, if that's okay. That sounds good to me. Thank you. All righty. So um, well, when we're doing our, our our flying, this is different than just, you know, launching a drone and flying it by hand and taking photos with, with it, which is a really popular thing to do. We see realtors, sometimes we'll, we'll fly a drone to take a picture of a, of a house for sale or just amateur photographers taking amazingly beautiful photos of landscapes and objects. Um, when we're talking about mapping, we're doing something uh, a little bit more technical or differently technical might be a better way to say it. And for us, it starts with kind of planning our work and planning the work consists of identifying the place we're gonna fly and the type of information we wanna get uh, out of that. So to do that, uh, once we've identified the place, we can then create a, a mission plan that, that will allow us to gather that level of detail. And so it will allow us to basically tell the mission planning software that we want this level of X level of detail, say a pixel of 2.5 centimeters. It will then suggest what the height above the ground needs to be for the aircraft to fly to attain that. And then also based on the quality of mapping we need, how much overlap we need between the photos in order to give us a good map. 
we want to make sure there are no gaps between photos and that there's sufficient overlap for us to actually be able to see these images in stereo and de determine uh, the size and height of objects from the image. So, you know, this is just a, a sample mission plan uh, to gather the entire preserve. This was quite a few flight lines to get that 2.5 centimeter level detail with the 80% overlap for each image. We don't always need that level of detail. And uh, we've typically flown the preserve with, with fewer flight lines and fewer photos. But I just wanted to give you a, a general idea of what a plan looks like. And it's great that the software will let automatically generate this. And this basically programs the autopilot uh, in, the, uh, in the drone. I can't imagine trying to manually fly a uh, flight plan like this with a drone. Uh, it would be, I would say, basically impossible. So it's good you know, to know what you're going to fly, how you're going to fly it, but you want to make sure that you can fly it, that you're authorized to fly it. So another part of mission planning uh, is knowing the airspace. So we need to check to make sure that we're not within a restricted area for flying, that we're not too close to an airport. And the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, has, you know, guidelines about where you can fly and how you can fly in different airspace around the country. And they've published some nice uh, tools that you can use to say, see that maybe you can only fly up to a certain altitude within a certain distance of an airport. And by going to the website and uh, putting in your location, it will generate a map and a report showing uh, whether it's basically okay to fly based on airspace and even tell you whether there's some restricted airspace nearby. For example, this report is telling me that I cannot fly over Petroglyph National Monument. Uh, we're not authorized to fly a drone over National Park Service uh, property. And just you know, to dive in, a lot of what we learn when we go through uh, the, the training to be a drone pilot is learning how to read these aeronautical charts. So this is kind of the less user-friendly version of some of the reporting uh, that we are able to get through other apps. But basically, this is telling me, again, uh, where I can fly uh, with, without needing extra permissions from uh, the uh, FAA. Another nice thing to know when you're planning your flight is whether it's gonna be decent weather and conditions. Uh, the regular weather report you can get when the forecasts are pretty good, but there's some nice tools that will help us for doing this when we fly a drone. So this uh, particular site, okay to fly, will give us a forecast of what the temperature and winds on an hourly basis uh, tailored to what drone pilots want to know. They want to know, especially gusts at different altitudes. Uh, they need to know how windy it is, you know, up to 400 feet, which is the top uh, altitude that we're authorized to fly drones here in the United States. Um, you know, whether there's going to be GPS coverage, as well as things, you know, that you would naturally want to know, like, is it going to rain? Is there going to be visibility? Things like that. So a little bit of weather planning uh, is very helpful. And so I will do all this, you know, a few days to a week in advance of my mission. And then on the day of, uh, I will do it all over again. And I can even do it on an app on my phone. Uh, so I'll go to those same sites, check out, you know, even when I get to the site, make sure everything looks good. I also can pull up a checklist uh, on my phone that will help me remember all the things that are so easy to forget, like, did I charge the batteries? Is there enough uh, uh, digital storage on my drone to collect these hundreds of images that I'm going to be collecting on this mission? As well as even things we don't often think of, like, am I in the mental state, uh, you know, to fly today, or do I have too much on my on my mind? It's kind of a good trigger to say, you know. Am I ready to go? And as much as you know, we want you know we want to get the information. We want to do it safely. And a lot of the uh, regulations and restrictions and best practices around operating a drone are geared towards safety as much as it is towards getting the job done.
Right. Well, once we decide, yes, we're good to go. Now we can fly our mission. So uh, these videos may or may not work very well. They're very short. So I'll just kind of give you a, a quick uh, uh, shot. And this is a mission that uh, Marine, uh, Dr. Fauscher down in the bottom right, she uh, she flew with our uh, Wingtra drone at Condelaria a while back. And it's really a neat uh, platform. It takes off vertically. And then it will transition to a horizontal flight like an airplane. And finally, it will land again vertically. This gives us a lot of flexibility uh, to uh, launch in areas where there might be restricted uh, access to, uh, to a nice, easy place to get to. And uh, if you look at all the smiles on the bottom right, that's the sign of a, of a successful landing. Uh, that's probably the most nerve wracking part. Uh, it's nothing like a wind gust coming up and, and having your $40,000 drone do cartwheels across the, the landscape. Can I get? Oops, let me change the slide again. And here's just a quick uh, view of our um, other drone that we have to launch by hand into the wind, but it's also a very, very good uh, drone as well. So this is a launch process for that one. A little bit nerve wracking in the launch as well. And when it lands, it actually does a belly landing on the ground. So uh, there can be some excitement, a few rapid heartbeats uh, during these operations. All right, we've flown the mission. That's That was kind of the fun part, maybe a little bit of the nerve wracking part, but now the, uh, the work begins to actually uh, put that mission to work for ourselves or whoever we're working with. And it starts with getting all the data out of a little SD card that is uh, attached to the camera in the drone. So basically it's a computer folder with, uh, in this case, we had 679 photos collected on this mission. And it stores it along with some other information we need in order to put it into a map. And so this is just a picture of kind of what it looks like in the uh, computer and the little report that we'll get uh, after we download and Sometimes we'll do a little extra processing to help uh, geolocate each one of those images a little bit more precisely than they would otherwise be just from the uh, GPS in the camera by itself. So we will then ingest those photos into software. There are a lot of different software programs out there. This one is called PIX4D. It is a very high-end professional software for creating maps and other kind of products from drone imagery. And so here we see a dot for every photo that was taken uh, and kind of some options for the types of products that we want to, to create. Uh, so this was kind of a good sense. Yeah, we covered the whole territory. You know, maybe in retrospect, we might have added an extra um, few photos around the margins to make sure we, we uh, had good coverage, but this this coverage did the job uh, for us. Um, and uh, again, it's a lot of data and it's gonna be very uh, technical data that has to be used for doing measurements. So there's extra processing other than just delivering a photo that has to be done. So our software will go and, and look at all the images and actually give us a preview of what our data will look like once once the uh, software is done with it. So in this case, it's showing us a, uh, a mosaic of all those aerial photos and a digital surface model uh, that gives us the elevation of all the uh, uh, objects uh, that are in that image. And we'll talk more about these products in a, middle, in a little bit. It will also give us a, a a report on how detailed those images will be. In this case, it was a little over a half an inch spatial resolution and uh, whether these uh, uh, 
uh, photos were very precisely geolocated, which in this case, they were down to uh, about two and a half centimeters. So what's going on in the background with all this? So it's a process that is uh, known as photogrammetry, essentially. It is taking all of those images and reading data that's recorded about their location and about their attitude in space, because we know that little aircraft will tilt a little bit. It'll be a little bit out of a perfect, uh, perpen, you know, parallel uh, um, flight path. So it has to correct for any kind of tilt, tilting of the images in the process. And that's what uh, is, go is showing here. So we're seeing these, uh, whatever, you know, hundreds of images in kind of space. And we're also seeing that uh, each uh, location in Condelaria, in this case, was covered by at least 12 different photos. And again, that's what allows us to build this measurement ready uh, 3D product we're gonna see in a minute. Um, and so we can inspect this, we can see uh, how each image is contributing to the final uh, uh, output for our product. Other kind of intermediate products that, that come out of this whole photogrammetry process I, I'm talking about are what's called a point cloud. What it's doing is through that process is it's basically creating a point in space that has the latitude, longitude, and elevation uh, of basically the entire space within the uh, area that was being imaged. And it turns it into a point or like a little dot in space. So when we looked uh, before, if you zoom in, you see these kind of little dot-like things here. Those are um, uh, used to generate the surfaces that we'll see here in a minute. And then it will kind of connect all those dots uh, to give us like a 3D uh, visualization called a triangular mesh or triangle mesh. So that's looking a little bit more like we're building a three-dimensional model from uh, that data we collected. It's not quite an image yet. It's just image data that we're able to display with our computer software. And here I've kind of combined combined it. So this is, again, just our uh, um, all those little points colorized by the uh, camera. Uh, and I put this here to point out that with this type of photography, we can't see underneath things. We can't see through objects. So some areas were pretty well obscured by tree canopy in this case. So that's why you have these very blurry areas here. They're the areas below the tree, uh, tree canopy that we were not able to see. By having as many different angles as possible, though, we do get a little bit of uh, data collected under the tree. But it, you know, when the canopy is very dense, there's nothing we can do about it. We can't see it. Um, you may have heard of LIDAR technology where it's using an emitted laser uh, beam. They will penetrate to the ground through canopy and we can actually uh, create surfaces and create images of objects that are hidden by tree canopy in some cases. But photogrammetry is just using a photo which cannot penetrate uh, those kind of even loose canopy like we see here. And so the products we're going to create uh, are these four items. I'll go over them one by one, starting with a with a uh, stitched together aerial image, and then going through these uh, uh, terrain products that a lot of engineers, especially, like to use. So an ortho image. Um, that term ortho is is interesting. Uh, literally, it means you know ortho would be like perpendicular or at right angles to. And it takes our photos and adjusts them in such a way as that we removes any distortion due to camera angle, essentially. So now every point on this image is seen as though you were vertically right on top of it, which allows you to do mapping and precise, you know, measurements off the off the image. So the cartoon on the bottom right kind of shows the idea that when it's orthographically corrected. Uh, we are looking just straight down on the object. Whereas if it were just a native 
photo, you would see some lean out from the center of the photo. We would see kind of a little bit of the sides of the ob objects. And the black and white image on the right illustrates that point by showing a, uh, a utility line or a road that's crossing a couple mountain ranges. On the left, it's what it looks like in a single frame from the camera. But when you do this photogrammetry process, uh, it corrects for all the different look angles and now straightened that to reflect its true mapping location. So we, in order to create maps, we have to do this kind of process with imagery in order to get everything uh, accurately located uh, on the ground. And kind of zooming in a little bit, again, the wonderful thing about this technology and the mapping side of it is we can do these measurements. Uh, so here I've zoomed in very closely into a location that's probably near and dear to many of the volunteers at the with the friends uh, near the, the Woodward, Woodward House. Um, and so we can actually, you know, draw a box and take a measurement of the area or draw a line and measure the length of objects uh, relatively precisely with this uh, with this data, I would say within, you know, a few centimeters uh, uh, accuracy, uh, not bad. And again, because of that georeferencing and the fact that we're doing it very precisely, we can overlay it on existing maps to uh, get to uh, to add additional information to our maps. We can now use this. Maybe we want to update a map or provide more detail about a map area. We can now do this because we can overlay this. We can bring it into what's called a geographic information system for further analysis or further extraction of features like water bodies or roads, things like that. Another really great product uh, that we're able to generate with our data, again, due to that multiple images of each spot, is a digital surface model. In this case, we have a uh, kind of like a photo uh, of the ground, uh, but where instead of the pixel values being like a brightness value, like you know the reflectance value of an object, it's the actual height above mean sea level of the top of the surface. So in this case, we have the elevation in meters of the tops of the trees, the tops of the buildings, the top of the ground. And uh, on the bottom, bottom right, you might not be able to see it very well, but I've kind of tilted it into a 3D view and exaggerated a little bit to show the idea that this is a elevation surface that includes the tops of everything. A lot of us in the mapping community really don't want to deal with that. We want to deal with what's called the bare ground. And through, again, the software, we can actually ask the software to strip off those features and just give us uh, what the elevations are um, at, the, uh, at the ground level. So at the base of the tree instead of the top of the tree, for example. With photography, there are some limitations in doing this in an automated way, because if the vegetation is very dense, or if an object is very large, the software may not know to remove it completely and will kind of blend it into the elevation surface. So we might need to go in and do some manual cleanup, which can be kind of tedious. Uh, but uh, even without that cleanup for many applications, uh, this would be a good, a good product to use. And again, on the bottom right, I've tilted it so you're now not seeing all those treetops anymore, but you might see that there's still a little bit of a bump there because the software on its own couldn't really um, distinguish uh, the tree completely down to the ground level. And again, it's always fun to look at things in 3D. So here I've just draped the, uh, the, uh, the image mosaic over that digital surface model, and then we can explore it, I can rotate it, and tilt it around and we can see uh, objects from, from different angles. We can see the houses, we can see the trees. And again, there's not a lot of relief here. So I just exaggerated the height by two to make it uh, things stand out and make it a little more visually compelling as well. And again, another product that uh, geographers and engineers uh, often use are contour maps. Those maps where we have these connected lines of equal elevation. 
And uh, in this case, with this this product, I generated uh, contour lines at a uh, 0.3 or about one foot uh, spacing. So there's one line for every one foot in, of change in, in elevation here. And you can see, uh, you know, you can start seeing some patterns even with those contour lines. And engineers especially like this level of detail uh, in their in their maps for some of their drawings. And they're usually dealing with even smaller geographic areas. And, you know, finally, we can also take that digital elevation model and that digital surface model and build a uh, what we call a digital height model, which is another data set that is just the height above the ground of all the features. So if I'm interested, for example, uh, in an area and I want to know what are the heights of the trees in that area, I could run this kind of process and it would give me uh, you know, the, the height of the tallest trees, for example. I'm uh, working on a project uh, related to the uh, a recovery of the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire uh, up in the Las Vegas and Mora area. And we're interested in the height of trees in the burned area above ground near power lines. So this will be the type of product that we want to generate to help the utility uh, mitigate future hazards uh, to the power lines by coming up with a height above the ground model uh, of the forest in the areas uh, of the power lines. And other planners, you know, especially say farmers and agricultural practitioners might be interested in the slope of the area. They want, might want to see how will water run across those surfaces. So we can use our GIS software to derive a slope map, or we can uh, create another type of visualization called a hillshade, which kind of a, provides kind of a uh, simulated illumination of the surfaces. In this case, as though the sun were in the north northwest and it illuminates uh, the surface to see what it looks like with a, a certain sun angle you know above the horizon and direction from north. This kind of technology is used a lot in like solar plant solar uh, panel planning because we can actually model the sun at different times of the year, different times of day in different directions from from north and different elevations above the horizon. It's a it's a very useful technology, but also can provide kind of uh, uh, engaging graphics as well. And uh, you know, one of the applications we really uh, uh, want to put to work here is to do a little bit of change analysis. I'll say right now that. Um, we we started this project at Condelaria more as just kind of a testing and training place, and we didn't really set up a schedule where we would try and fly it on the same day, same time every year. But we could get to that, and we could also look at it seasonally as well, so that we are flying at say spring and and fall, and maybe even in the summer. You know, try and coincide with a peak growing season, for example, might be might be useful. Um, that's one of the great things about working with a drone, which you have control over the timing of, uh, we can kind of customize when we want to come back to a site. Uh, a lot of satellite sensors, that's kind of built in for a uh, specific uh, repeat at a specific interval. Uh, doing this with aircraft would be very expensive, uh, but drones kind of gives us an opportunity to revisit a small site fairly frequently and again on a, uh, you know, maybe on a standard interval from year to year. And uh, I'll try to remember later on to share this uh, link that's a, a web map uh, where we can actually overlay these two and you can swipe back and forth and see how the change was between those two dates. Vegetation analysis, uh, we, as I mentioned, we have that near infrared sensor now on several of our drones, and we can start looking at these areas again in those wavelengths that we can't detect with our own eye. And as I mentioned, uh, growing vegetation stands out really strongly in the near infrared. So on the left, you'll see like a normal color image of this area, and it doesn't really look like there's anything growing. There's nothing green uh, that, that, that stands out to the eye. If you're walking out there, you might see a few uh, 
blades of green, but they really don't stand out. Once you uh, put it through the uh, into this infrared part of the spectrum, though, we can see, yeah, there's actually a little bit of growth going on on the tips of these uh, elm trees out there. Probably not a lot. Maybe there's just a little bit of uh, photosynthesis going on in the uh, buds uh, uh, in the tips of the limbs, but we can detect that now. And doing some other kind of manipulation of the data, we can actually tease that out and have the imagery highlight places for us where that growth might be uh, occurring. And that's what that bottom right is. We call that a normalized difference vegetation index. We're basically comparing the near infrared where vegetation stands out very strongly to red wavelength, the red wavelength where vegetation is very weak. So it kind of exaggerates the difference and helps cue us in to areas where there might be growth going on. It's all relative, you know, that's not to say that all those places that are very green here are growing very much, but it's just kind of to clue you in that there might be some growth already happening in February in uh, those places that stand out as green on this image. And that was, you know, kind of a, a fairly rapid, uh, but overall complete, I think, overview of the type of work we're trying to do at Condelaria Nature uh, Preserve with, uh, with our drones and that we're extending to other projects around New Mexico and that we support the faculty and students at Highlands in their studies and research as well. And we do have a few other people on the call who can speak, you know, to some of the things uh, uh, that they've been doing with uh, with this work as well. And so, uh, finally got around to opening the chat uh, too, so we can address some of those questions as well. So uh, I will actually first turn it back to Katie as our moderator to say, uh, would you like me to just kind of work through some of these uh, chat questions now? Yeah, I think that would be a really good idea. I'm going to... Um... Trying to make it so we can all see each other here again. And um, do you mind stopping sharing? I think that will help, and we can kind of okay see folks. I'm sorry and, about the not seeing the side of the side. I think that might have been a local. Okay, oh I yeah, that was just a local thing. I think okay. you, if you want to ask a question, you can either put it in the chat or you can actually raise your hand. I think we'll be able to see you. I'm going to do this. Um, so the first questions from. Herhanu Jayanto, and do you think it is appropriate doing the supervised image classification using the RGB ortho mosaic based on visual interpretation? I'll do the, uh, the short like answer it. to that is um, supervised classification is kind of like a machine learning way to uh, automatically identify or at least group objects in an image. I found with there's just not enough different uh, wavelengths really to do that very well. You can do a limited amount, especially with some new technologies uh, that use uh, things other than the spectrum. They'll use like the object shape and texture. It's called object-oriented classification, but uh, four bands really isn't enough to do a very good uh, classification on its own. You really need to enhance it with other information. How long can each drone stay in the air before it needs a battery change or a charge? Um, so uh, Dr. Petronas and Dr. Felscher can speak to this more, but I think 45 minutes uh, with the Wingtra is kind of where we're feeling that's the comfort level. The cool thing about these drones is they will, uh, you program them to land when it gets to a danger point, so you don't uh, have to worry about it too much. The wing pro was actually, the vertical one that went up and down like that? Yeah, and actually all of them have kind of like a little bit of a fail safe in them to like land it if the battery gets too low. And they will actually allow you to swap the battery and then continue their mission. The drones are actually flying a lot faster than they even used to. The wing tro is very fast. You can cover, um, I think we could easily do, um, I don't know, what do you think? Maybe five square miles or more in a day of flying. Um, mm. they cover a lot of territory really, really quickly. So depending on the level of detail you need, you can cover a lot of ground in a, in a day just by 
launching, you know, as long as you have enough batteries and can keep them charged, uh, uh, you can cover a lot of ground. Um, Jeannie Ellen asked, um, did, has the open space division or the Rio Grande return and Ciudad soil and water conservation district expressed interest in the data that you found? Is there a practical application? They're just now starting to, they, they, their, their biologist is on board. I need to get them some of the data, data as, as well. And definitely for like the terrain data, because they're doing so much, uh, uh, you know, alter alteration of the ground there. This is going to help them kind of track what they've done and and maybe help them plan out in more detail in the future. So we're still working on applications with them. Um, I'm sorry if I'm ruining your name, Herdanu Jayanto. I probably am ruining your name, but they would really like it if you shared more cl object based classification with them. So maybe if you want to put your email in the chat, he can they can reach out to you um that'd be great yeah i'll definitely do that and uh for anybody else too if you have other questions that come to you offline okay i know i seem to have asked a question of you but it's actually my husband has a friend in servietta plaza north of ojo caliente who's doing a land recovery project on traditionally irrigated fields that have a slope unlike our valley how could he access these tools and are there grants available, for example, to figure out the key line, the field based on elevation change? Is that something that exists? Are there grants to help support your work? Well, first I'll answer the technology question is, yeah, this technology could, could probably be, be useful for that. And I'll ask Dr. Patronus, I'll put him on the spot as far as ways maybe that someone could get uh, uh, involved with this. I'm curious if you found anything in, in doing this that stood out to you that might be different from other sites. Um, and that, that's what I really wanted to know. Like, did you see things that surprised you or or was it just sort of like looked look like other fields you've done in the valley? Um. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mike or Marie. We really haven't done any other farm farm field kind of projects uh, like this. We've done a little bit in uh, um, near uh, Las Vegas, uh, New Mexico, um, but just not not this kind of work. So it's kind of apples and oranges a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Mason asks: Are there data products? Any of these data products appropriate for sharing online? And I guess maybe um, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. Just pipe up. But are you meaning like the final pictures and things that look so cool? Yeah, yeah. So since we're working, you know, with with uh, the nature preserve, I would kind of defer to them on how they want to share the, uh, uh, the product, the products. And there's there's going to be ways we can share it in a way that's more like user friendly for the general public so you don't need all the GIS tools that would be my recommended way to to share the this kind of information so you can kind of zoom in and and zoom out but we want to make sure that the the folks who actually uh are managing the land are comfortable with with uh with that um Cheryl asks how do you set the parameters of where the drone will fly and I'm going to tag on to that is it like an app that you like say these are the corners and go back and forth a hundred times so, yeah actually you tell these are the corners and it'll tell you how many times it's going to go back and forth uh, to get what you want uh, and sometimes you can actually create a, uh, a google earth uh, file and upload it into the uh, mission uh, planning a, and operations app and it will uh, then calculate the mission uh, and uh, then you just put it on automatic pilot and it flies the mission based on the uh, on the footprint of the uh, of the file you upload or you can interactively draw that footprint on the uh, on the app in the field once you're there as well Jeannie wants to know she's just curious we don't speak in meters you know in the US we have no <laughs> idea what that means so was it at about 400 feet altitude your drone so 400 feet is the maximum ceiling we're authorized by FAA. We've been keeping it. I 
around 200 feet. I think 75 meters was, you know, what, 225 feet or something like that. Um, so uh, between about 100 and 200 feet uh, seems to give us a good level of detail and efficiently cover a fair amount of ground. Um, but again, how high we fly will be based on the level of detail we need. And also, we're a little bit nervous about things that stick up above the ground. Um, so we want to be above the trees, the power lines, and stuff like that. The drones do have some capability to avoid obstacles. I just don't want to test it. Um, I don't blame I'll you. I'll leave that to Dr. Patronus okay. also to, to, to see if the uh, $40,000 wing trail will uh, avoid the power line after all. I can see the hesitancy. Uh, Mr. Patronus also offered, uh, he said that they are available to fly missions if others are interested. And the, his, the email is of Mr. Patronus is in the chat. And um, I do think that's a good use for, for that, for that Servietta Plaza, which is such an unusual farming experience. Um, so Herdanu asked another great question, which is, do you have experience harnessing the thermal or night drone that you could share and the application for natural resource management? So the, uh, there are a few vendors that actually do make a thermal sensor that you can put on the drone, even on the small quadcopter copter ones. Uh, we don't have one of those. Uh, one of the applications that was presented to us was at one point was at the forestry department at Highlands a number of years ago, they were interested in uh, flying over a uh, place where they were doing uh, uh, a study on fire fire effects, you know, for like they're going to do a, a prescribed fire and wanted to look at the uh, at the heat, you know, in the area that was burned. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of different applications for, for uh, thermal uh, uh, imaging, a lot of them used by utilities for finding like leaks or hot spots things like, like that, but we don't have that technology. Um, wildlife, yeah, so. Um, yeah, uh, wildlife, yeah. the reactions from wildlife, I know my reaction when I see a drone over my yard, so I want to know how, how are the animals reacting that aren't? So I'll, uh, I'll answer, I'll, I'll say two things to that. I'll let, you know, again, others can chime in if they want, Maureen and, and Mike, but first of all, uh, uh, one of the more interesting uses of drone I've seen was by Fish and Wildlife Service, where at night they flew over some ponds where uh, cranes, or I don't know, they were geese, I think in this case, were uh, were uh, spending the night and they were using that to inventory because they would get that thermal, they were using the thermal sensor uh, for that. So that was kind of a neat application. As far as wildlife encounters, that's kind of another one of those little stressful things on that wing-shaped or bat-shaped one, that black one. Uh, since then, they've put on some like really bright pink reflective tape on it and put some decals of eyes on it because um, the the hawks will definitely check out the drone. They'll kind of really monitor it and kind of get an eye on those fixed wing ones. And there's all kinds of videos on YouTube of the quadcopters being taken out by different raptors and stuff like that. Um, Maureen, you know, at, at Condelaria, do you remember any uh, any agitation about? Uh, I remember we were nervous at some point. Hi, everyone. Um, we were nervous at some point because there was a couple of birds that seemed a little big, but um, it was when we were flying the wing tra and it was above their level. And by the time the wing tra came back to land, they were gone. Yeah, yeah I, this is Mike. <laughs> so yeah, we for these missions that we've been flying, a lot of them were flying pretty high, so 400 feet. And like Joe was saying, the wing tra, it's moving. It can, it's like 40 miles an hour in the air. So you see it and it's gone. So they, it's not like the quadcopters where those, the noise, and you know, that's like you said, flying into your backyard, you know, they fly a little bit slower um, and they do tend to make a little bit more noise. But the big drones, you really wouldn't even notice it. I mean, it's bright orange, but it's pretty high up in the sky and moving pretty quick. And it's pretty quiet. Yeah. Which is impressive. Yeah, I flew the quadcopter out at Condelaria just as a little training uh, project uh, last week and the cranes 
were out um and um they they were they were interested um they they kind of gaggled around below it and then they uh they kind of gaggled around above it and then they flew off af after a while um but they're back so it didn't like uh traumatize them and i've seen you know the other things that do traumatize cranes like coyotes and other things out there so i figure they don't have a memory of a particularly bad experience with a with a drone so i don't think it's gonna uh keep them from coming back to their favorite uh place to to hang out at the convalaria nature preserve it's just been so fascinating do we have any more questions it really has been thank you Jeannie. seconds it's really been wonderful to learn from you all of this thank you so much and Thanks for the good work you're doing. I can't wait to see over time how things change. We should have you come back in like two years since there was a huge change even between 2022 and now and, and see what it looks like after that. It'd be pretty cool. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Dr. Patronus though for really energizing our, our drone program at Highlands and engaging with the community uh, so well to kind of show off what we can do with this technology and give the students, uh, you know, opportunities to to learn at the same time. Uh, you know, we're, we're always going to be limited by capacity in a certain way to take on projects, but you know, where we can, um, you know, we we do, and I think it's a growth industry both within academia and private industry, and I think there'll be a lot of opportunities over time for these services to be available. Is there a good entry place for people who might don't know nothing about drones, but might want to just try and and just check them out? Is there any vector for the amateur other than buying your own drone? Is there like a club or anything? Yeah. In town? yeah. Okay. Yeah, Joe. What was that? You just sent me a link to it. The uh, there's one in Albuquerque that recently started up. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Not recently, that. but been. Not I think me. we're we're trying to get for mapping the New Mexico Geographic Information Council, but for like personal people, uh, there are so many so many resources on the internet just to kind of learn a little bit about it. Drone U is one that I sometimes uh, go to. Uh, there are some very inexpensive ones. They don't have the mapping capability, but if you just want to get familiar with like launching and operating. Uh, there are some very inexpensive ones you can get to uh, start playing around with them. Um, safety is the main thing, though, is take the time to learn the rules, the FAA rules, even if you're not required as an amateur uh, to, to get the license. I would say go through, you know, there's a lot of uh, web-based, um, you know, YouTube videos that are basically the entire uh, training you need to get a license do that because you just learn so much and it reinforces again those safety uh, rules about things like flying over people and flying at night and a lot of things that you really need to make sure you know uh, before you start uh, doing this. That's that's really cool. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. I wanted to let folks know that we actually have a, um, let me just make sure I have just this guy up here. We have all kinds of um, great programming that I've been lining up for us, and I'm excited to share with you. I'm gonna go here. Next month, we're doing um, this one, which I'm sorry, it's coming out so, so small here, but it's Cameron. Our own Cameron is going to present to us on what is happening with the restoration and regeneration at the preserve. And there's a lot to report, and I'm really excited to hear from her. Once again, please do register um, and, and make sure we can keep track of how many folks are coming. It's been really delightful. In the coming up in the future, we are going to be having, and I'll stop sharing now, unless you all want me to leave this up. Um, coming up in the future, we're going to be having talks about the birds of the Candelaria Nature Preserve. You might recall Joe Strange was only got through the mammals. There's just so much happening over there. And um, so that's that's happening as well. And then in the future, we're going to be 
learning about Pueblo culture and the Pueblo history of the Rio Grande Valley uh, and of that area. And so that is coming from John Jahadi, who's going to be one of our presenters. And several other folks, Laura Paskis is coming up this summer. She would like to talk about learning to love our brand new in environment that we're landing with here in, in New Mexico, thanks to the drought. So uh, lots of great stuff coming up. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. We will get these up on YouTube really, really soon. And uh, thanks so much for being being part of it and, and keeping up with us. Um, and Jeannie, I think there's a way to subscribe to the Friends newsletter. Is there a handy tool to subscribe? But in the meantime, you can just reach out to me. You all have my email now and we'll be happy to subscribe you to our list if you're not already on it. So thanks so much, Joe. We sure appreciate you. Did I miss it? Right, thanks for inviting me. You are so welcome. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye, right. everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.